Good afternoon and welcome to this month's WorkRight webinar. It's our first WorkRight webinar for a while, so thank you all for returning if you are regular listeners and a warm welcome to anyone who's tuning in for the first time. Today we are going to talk about the hottest topic in town in data protection and privacy. This topic is GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation, which I'm sure all of you have come across many times over the last few months. My name is Chris Jones, I'm the Technical Director here at Posturite and with me today is Ryan Church who some of you will know is our WorkRight Sales Manager. Now it's important to point out from the start that neither Ryan or I are legally trained so to be clear we are not providing any form of legal advice in today's broadcast. So if you'd like to tune out now you're welcome to um, or alternatively uh, you're welcome to stay and listen to our ramblings. Uh, our aim in today is simply to share some of our experiences we have had during our pursuit of ensuring Posturite is GDPR ready ahead of the May 25th deadline and by doing so potentially answering some of your initial questions that you may have. Ryan's going to take us through our new e-learning course on the subjects of GDPR awareness which just so happens to be available to purchase from today for new and existing WorkRight customers. Uh, we'll be sharing a promo code with you towards the end of the discussion, which will save you 20% on the list price. So listen in for that, and I'm sure Ryan will uh, be following up uh, with many of you afterwards anyway. Uh, we're then going to talk about a couple of areas of our business, not just within WorkRight, um, that we've had to have a look at in order to meet with the new regulations. And to finish off, um, if you'd like to ask any questions uh, within the panel, probably on your uh, bottom right hand side of the screen we'll do our best to uh, answer as many of those questions that come up um, hopefully that might either uh, offer you some direction or at least a line of questioning that you can take back within your own businesses if you haven't done already so Ryan uh, good afternoon and over to you to look at our new course Thanks very much, Chris. And yeah, it's good to be um, get these webinars back on track. It's been a couple of months since, like, like you said, since we've had a, a work right webinar. But uh, this subject of GDPR has been um, uh, very much at the forefront for the last six to eight months for us, being data processors with our uh, with our work right system. So let's take you through the course um, and start off with what is work, what is GDPR. Um, all of our e-learning courses have the, the home page that directs you as to how the page works. But if I just read through for you, um, and Chris, if you've got any questions as we go through, just uh, feel free to, to, to pop in for me. Uh, the European, uh, sorry, the European General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, GDPR, is an EU regulation intended to increase data protection rights for all EU citizens and to provide clear guidance for companies. The GDPR aims to meet the challenging challenges of protecting privacy in an expanding online world where the amount of information people collect, store, and process is increasing rapidly. 25th of May, uh, the GDPR is enforceable from the 25th of May 2018. It, uh, it will form the basis of data protection law in the UK, irrespective of the outcome of Brexit. That's important to point out. Some customers have actually asked me that question. Brexit is actually not going to um, affect this particular so, piece of so legislation. So what's going to happen either way, Ryan? Um, this uh, this law basically comes into effect on the 25th of May, regardless of whether, um, regardless of the conversations um, and the agreement and the settlement we get with uh, the European so I guess, Union. I guess in any event, the GDPR, which is the EU, EU legislation, if I'm getting this right, will be enshrined into UK law in one form or another anyway, regardless of what's going on in the overall political climate. That is absolutely our understanding, yes. So what does GDPR do? If you or your organization are already subject to the UK Data Protection Act 1998, you will be subject to the GDPR. This will mean some important changes for all organizations involved in collecting and processing personal data. This is because the GDPR applies to all goods and services supplied to EU citizens, irrespective of where in the world a company is based. Increased accountability for all organizations that need to demonstrate ongoing compliance, puts personal data firmly in the control of the individual, strengthens the parental consent needed to collect data on children and raises the risks associated with non-compliance with large penalties for data security breaches. So what is the impact of GDPR? GDPR affects how you collect and manage data within your company or organization to ensure your organization protects an individual's privacy and is more accountable. You need to know what data you collect and how you collect it, including whether you are legally entitled to collect it, 
what data is classed as personal data and which is sensitive personal data, how you use data within your company and how you share the data you use. Research, sorry, research shows that more than 80% of people feel that they do not have complete control over their data online. Small article there from the government, which I, I won't I click into just yet. Particularly more so recently with the uh, various social media groups and uh, whatnot in the headlines recently, I think it's become even more to the forefront ahead of the legislation, really. Very much so, yes, indeed. Um, what is personal data? Personal data is any information by which an individual can be directly or indirectly identified. You will need to be able to recognize the type of personal data you collect and how you process it, whether this is through automated or manual filing systems. The GDPR provides further guidelines on the type of data about an individual that are personal data that is personal data and therefore subject to the regulations. This includes the data that enables identification of someone by reference to a name, number, location or online identifier such as an IP address. It also includes identification by one or more factors specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural or social identity of that person. The, the GDPR also refers to the sensitive personal data as special categories of data. This means data that needs to be treated with greater care as it could be used in a discriminatory way. Sensitive data can be, uh, can be on the following, racial or ethnic origin, religious or philosophical beliefs, political opinions or trade union membership, health or sex life, sexual orientation, genetic or biometric data. Criminal offences. Under the GDPR, personal data relating to criminal convictions and offences can only be processed by an official authority when authorised under UK law. So what is processing? Um, processing is defined by the GDPR as any activity that involves collecting, storing or deleting personal data by either manual or automated means. This includes complex things like testing any new IT systems or applications or assessing the impact of any changes made to existing systems. Processing is also simple tasks that you do. For example, opening the, uh, the uh, sorry, opening and reading a document on your PC screen. The general rule of thumb is if you are doing anything to personal data, you are probably processing it. Uh, so it, the, the, the task here is to click on activities you think are also covered by the term processing. I'm going to click on the first option here, as I would have thought altering is absolutely processing. You'll see here that the answer is good try. However, the term processing actually refers to all of these activities performed on data or sets of data. So the correct answer on this page here is all of the above. Lawful basis. All organizations must always have a lawful basis for processing personal data and make this clear to the data subject as it can affect their legal rights. If you do not have at least one of these, then it is likely that, you are, that the processing is not compliant with GDPR. The GDPR allows EU member states to introduce more specific provisions if they wish. Consent. Consent is a lawful basis for processing where the data subject has explicitly consented through a positive opt-in Implicit or hidden consent such as pre-ticked boxes do not comply. This is most likely to be used where marketing activity is taking place. Contractual necessity. Processing data is permitted if it is necessary to prepare for, enter into or perform a contractual agreement with the data subject. Compliance with legal obligation. Personal data can be processed on the basis that the controller is performing the data processing to comply with legal obligation. Vital interest. Processing is lawful. Uh, uh, sorry, processing is lawful if it is needed to protect the vital interest if the data subject and significantly the interest of others, such as children. And public interest. Processing is permitted if it is necessary for the performance of tasks that is carried out in the public interest or under official authority. So, GDPR roles. Who is a data subject? In an individual who shares their personal information is also known as the data subject. They own all the information about them and have control over how and where their personal data is used. Data subject can limit access to their personal data, request incorrect or outdated information about them to be rectified, 
request data about themselves to be deleted. Note, uh, there are some exceptions to this in case of legislative processes, historical or statistical purposes, and archiving. The supervisory authority, the GDPR is enforced uh, in the UK by, in, sorry, by Information Commissioner's Office or the ICO. This supervisory authority supports businesses to ensure the company, sorry, sorry to ensure they comply with the GDPR by managing and securing their data properly. The ICO also has the power to defend consumer interests and issues fines for breaches of the regulations. If organizations operate out of different locations in the, EU, in the EU, they need to nominate a supervisory authority. So data controllers and processors. Under the GDPR, data controllers and processors carry legal responsibility for ensuring privacy and security when collecting, managing, and storing of data. The data controller. Data controller is the individual organization or public authority that decides what personal data is collected and why and how it is to be processed. Under the GDPR, they are required to keep records as evidence of data processing, contracts and activities. The data controller is also required to register their data processing activities with the relevant supervisory authority. If data controllers use a data processor, they remain responsible for ensuring that their contracts with processors comply with the GDPR. It's an interesting point to interlude here, Chris, that um, our workright customers are data controllers, and we as, uh, as the provider of the workright solution, we are the data processor. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes, which, and I think um, one of the a uh, sort of key change between the sort of um, DPA laws and GDPR is actually quite a lot more onus has been put on the data processor not in terms of um, uh, exactly what the data is but it's the technical controls and making sure we keep it safe and, and all that sort of stuff I think that's all been increased quite significantly um, on, the, on the data processor. Absolutely so the data processor uh, is the individual company organization or any other body that processes data on behalf of the data controller the processor has specific legal or sorry has specific legal obligations to maintain records of data and processing activities under the gdpr the data processor has significantly more liability in the case of a breach okay Data protection officers, the GDPR requires public authorities and companies involved in regular large scale data processing to appoint a data protection officer or DPO. The expert knowledge of data protection laws so, so that they can provide support and authority. It's taking a moment or two to. We're going to hold up here with the there we go. parties. A third party is any individual, company, or public authority other than the data subject, processor, or controller that is involved in handling data. This includes any individual or organization or authorized by the controller or processor to process personal data. Case studies. We've got three questions here on the same case study. Now, Jane works part time as an administrator for a large accounting company named Smith and Jones, which provides payroll services for several smaller businesses. The company has a service contract with Gardening Angels to provide direct payroll services to its employees. Smith and Jones needs to update the details of everyone on Gardening, on Gardening Angels payroll, but is currently short staffed. So contracts Jane to complete this on a freelance basis. Now, question one, who is the data controller? On what we've heard previously, um, I'm going to go with Jane, um, but then I would be told that my answer is incorrect as Gardening Angels is the data controller. It de determines what data is to be collected and how it is to be used. Question two, who is the data processor? A person looking after the data, sorry, processing the data would be, again, I would have thought Jane, just on my um, initial sort of review. Okay, I'm wrong again. In this case, Smith & Jones is the data processor as it is contracted to provide this service on behalf of Gardening Angels. Third question, as a freelance service provider, Jane is, now, I'm pretty sure she's not a data controller or a data processor, so let's go with third party. 
one out of three is not too bad, I guess. It's better than zero there, Chris. Um, Jane is the third party contracted to provide a service on behalf of the data processor. Smith & Jones, Gardening Angels remains the data controller. Okay, so the DDPR principles. Okay, here we go. Introduction. The GDPR principles determine how organizations should manage, process, and secure personal data, sorry, personal and sensitive data while protecting the rights of the data subject. To comply with the GDPR, organizations need to embed seven privacy principles into their operation. Lawfulness. Personal data must be processed in a fair, lawful, and transparent way that meets the criteria of the GDPR. This includes a basis relating to consent, contractual necessity, compliance with the legal obligation, vital interest, or the public interest, the subject being clearly informed about the identity and contact details of the controller, what data processing will be done. The purpose. Uh, the, purpose uh, the purpose limitation principle means that personal data can only be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes. Personal data collected for one purpose should not be used for a new purpose without further consent. Minimization. Data minimization means an organization should only process the personal data that it needs to to process the uh, pro needs to process to the, achieve its purpose. Excuse me. The personal data should be adequate, relevant, and limited to the purpose for which it was collected. Accuracy. Data controllers are responsible for ensuring, wherever possible, that all personal data is accurate and kept up to date to avoid potential risks to the data subject. Inaccurate data is rectified or erased as soon as possible. Storage limitations: data should be retained for longer than uh, should not be retained for longer than necessary. Data can be stored for longer periods with additional GDPR safeguards, but only if archiving is in the public interest. Uh, it is for scientific or historical research. Confidentiality: data controllers are required to use appropriate technical or, or, or organizational measures to ensure data is protected against unlawful processing, accidental loss destruction or damage. And finally, accountability. Data controllers and processors must show how they comply with these principles, for example, by documenting their decisions taken uh, about processing activity. The accountability principle is the most significant addition to the GDPR and seeks to guarantee the enforcement of the other principles. So, another case study here, a large insurance company provides reinsuring services to several smaller insurance companies. It has collected large amounts of data from its various activities with these companies and now wants to consolidate this into a single database for future use in marketing their other products. Can they do this? I'm pretty confident it's a no in this case. Well done, that is correct. Personal data collected for one activity such as part of a uh, service contract cannot be kept or used for another in, uh, incompatible process, such as marketing. Under the GDPR, the larger company would need to obtain new consent from the data subjects affected to create the database. We've got an example of this actually, Chris, I think uh, afterwards with our marketing, sort of collation of marketing information, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Case study consent. Uh, consent as a lawful basis for collecting and processing personal data will need to meet GDPR standards. Individuals have more rights when their consent is relied upon to process their personal or sensitive data. Uh, data subjects should be provided with a clear explanation of the specific processing activities to which they are consenting. Um, consent to process an individual's data needs to be freely given through a positive opt-in and consent should be clearly indicated and separate from any other terms and conditions. Data subjects should also be able to easily withdraw their consent. The GDPR gives significant rights to data subjects. Those controlling the, and processing data should check their procedures to ensure they comply with these rights. Right to access. Individuals have the right to seek confirmation that their data is being processed. They have a right to access their personal data and supplementary information. They should not be charged for accessing their personal data. And those handling data have one month to comply with a, uh, with a request to access the data. Right to corrections. Individuals are entitled to have personal data rectified if it is inaccurate or incomplete. If the personal data in question has been disclosed to third parties, these parties must be informed of the rectification where possible. Individuals must also be informed about the third parties to whom the data has been disclosed where appropriate. Right to erasure. 
individuals have a right to erase uh, erase the uh, memories of the, the the band there individuals <laughs> have, a, have a right to erase their personal data and to prevent processing in circumstances such as the personal data is no longer necessary in relation to the purpose for which it, it was originally collected the individual withdraws consent the individual objects to the processing and there is no overriding legitimate interest for continuing the processing the personal data was unlawfully processed the personal data has to, has to be uh, erased in order to comply with the legal obligation the personal data is processed in relation to the offering of online information services to a child right to object individuals have the right to object to processing based on public interest or exercise of official authority including profiling direct marketing including profiling processing of purposes of scientific historical research and statistics rights related to automated profiling and decision making the GDPR provides detailed safeguards to protect individuals from the risk of potentially damaging decisions being taken based solely on automated processing without human intervention. Individuals have the right to obtain human intervention, express their point of view, obtain an explanation of any decision based on automated processing and challenge it. Children's personal data. The GDPR enhances the protection of children's personal data, especially in the area of social networking. Consent from a parent or guardian will be needed for you or your organization to collect personal data from a child. The GDPR defines a child as under 16 years of age, but allows countries to change from this down to under 13 years of age. You need to do so. Consent from a parent or guardian or to process children's data may be needed even when services are offered online. Privacy notices should be clearly written in a way that is easily understandable to a child directly I've lost my audio just bear with us a second I think um, we're, we're just gonna have a look at Ryan's machine quickly I think we've got a, a small connection issue so just hold on there we go back back in action Apologies for that. Wi-Fi wasn't as strong as I anticipated. Where do we get to? So data portability. Data portability gives individuals provided online from one data controller to another. Data portability only applies to personal data an individual has freely provided to a controller online. Data controllers will need to ensure they can provide individuals with a copy of their personal data in commonly used formats that support reuse. Data subjects can request to obtain their personal data generated and collected from their activities online. And data portability does not apply to data that is inferred from online activities. Privacy by design. The GDPR principle of privacy by design requires organizations to be proactive in embedding data privacy and security into their data handling systems. Default settings built into systems should, be, should protect personal data rather than requiring the individual to set up privacy settings. And organizations will need to assess the risks to data and may need to review and introduce new methods of data handling. It may be necessary to build new IT systems for securely storing or accessing personal data. So how do we apply the GDPR? Uh, the objective of the GDPR is to protect and strengthen the, the rights of data subjects. The first step in making sure you comply with GDPR is to understand how you, your customers and everyone connected to your company or, or organization will be affected by the regulations. Audit and review, you will need to know what personal data you collect and how you, your company or organization manage and store it. As GDPR is an ongoing requirement, you will need to keep reviewing how you manage and process data and service contracts in the future to make sure you continue to comply with GDPR. I think that's quite a good point actually, Ryan, because I think um, there's been a lot of energy over the last few months about getting ready for GDPR. And, and I think a lot of activities have uh, hopefully taken place all around uh, well, the country and the, and the EU, I suppose. But what we need to remember, this is just becoming a new law and this is this is a forever or until it gets changed again but this is this is an ongoing obligation that we have so any new process needs to comply 
Absolutely. And I, I think only, only found out that in the last day or two that the actual Data Protection Act is, isn't actually being repealed. So where there's gaps in GDPR, if it's not actually matching DPA, there's, there's, there's still stand, yeah. stands in law. So. Exactly, which is also being reviewed this year as well. So it's all it's all lovely and complicated. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure it will keep lawyers and solicitors busy for a long, long time as well. So. Absolutely. OK, so the audit and review. The review... Do you do your sorry? Do your existing systems and processes allow you to quickly identify and isolate all copies of personal data relating to a particular data subject? Update. Do your processes need updating to reflect the rights of data subjects under the GDPR? Have you got controls in place to make sure only those who are authorised to see your data do? Do you encrypt files or documents when exchanging them with people outside your organisation? And do you remove data when it is no longer needed? Training. Employees who process personal data need to be appropriately trained so they can quickly recognize and respond to requests from data subjects to exercise their rights. There's an interesting point on this one here because I keep getting asked who needs to um, go through GDPR training and the reality is if anybody's sort of taking down an email address or any sort of personal de personal information they need to have at least an understanding I would say of the, of the new GDPR uh, regulations. Data Protection Impact Assessments, so DPIAs. Organizations planning to process personal data are required to perform a data impact assessment, especially when there is a high risk to the rights of the data subject. If a DPIA shows there is an extremely high risk to data security, data controllers are required to notify the supervisory authority, the ICO in the UK. Which of these factors do you think present a higher risk to an individual, a new IT system or a large amount of data? I would say uh, a new IT system. That's right. The new IT system presents a higher risk the, and other risk factors include automated decision making, the processing of sensitive data and the combining of sets of data. Collecting and processing personal data. A core principle of the GDPR is that there is transparency and clarity for data subjects with regard to the processing of their personal data. Prior to collecting personal data, you will need to ensure that you fully inform individuals of the, your reasons and planned activities. Who? The identity of the data controller, any recipients with whom you may share their personal data, the what? about the categories of data being processed, whether any automated decision-making exists, including profiling, the why? The reason and the lawful basis for processing their personal data, the subject, sorry, the data subjects rights, including the right to withdraw consent, the how. How you received the data if you did not specifically request it, the right to complain to the supervisory authority, and the when. How long you plan to store the data for. Erasing personal data, in what, uh, in what is commonly known as the right to be forgotten, individuals can, in specific circumstances, request the erasure of their data. Whether personal data is no longer needed for its original purpose, when the individual withdraws consent, when the individual objects to the processing and there is no overriding legitimate interest for continuing the processing, if there was no lawful basis for processing the data, Erasure is necessary to comply with legal obligation or the personal data is processed in relation to the offer of information society services to a child, sorry, society services to a child. Erasure exceptions. There are some instances when you can refuse to comply with a request for erasure of an individual's personal data. Freedom of expression and information rights to comply with an exercise of official authority, legal obligation, or in the public interest. Public health purposes, archiving of statistical activities, scientific or historical research, or defense or legal claims. Demonstrating accountability. In order to comply with the GDPR's accountability principles, you are expected to put into place comprehensive but proportionate governance measures. This means keeping accurate records of processing activities, policies, and staffing. Last training module here is data breaches. What is a personal data breach? Within the GDPR, a personal data breach refers to a much wider definition of a breach of security. The exact wording from the le uh, legislation is a breach of security leading to the accidental unlawful destruction, loss, alteration 
unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data transmitted, stored or otherwise processed. What happens if there is a breach? The data protection officer is required to notify the supervising authority of any personal data breaches that are likely to result in a, in a risk to individuals or cause significant economic or social disadvantage. Data subjects need to be notified directly if the breach is likely to result in a high risk to their rights and freedoms. The threshold for notifying individuals is higher than notifying the supervising, sorry, notifying the supervising authority. What do we need to report? The GDPR places significant responsibility on both the data controller and the data processor for detecting and reporting any breaches. If you do need to report a breach, the ICO will require specific information. Information about type of data, the number of people possibly affected, the name and contact details of the data protection officer or contact point uh, where more information can be obtained, a description of the likely consequences of the personal data breach, and a description of the measure that the measures taken or proposed to be taken to to deal with the personal data breach and to mitigate any possible adverse effects where appropriate when do we have to notify there are strict timescales for reporting a security breach this makes it vital to have robust detection investigation and internal reporting procedures in place how long do you have to report breach a uh, report a breach once you become aware of it 24 hours, 72 hours, or a month? Chris, what do you think? Oh, sorry, Ryan, I was, uh, I was on mute there. Um, and I, I was just um, rehearsing what I was gonna say at the end. So um, you've caught me completely <laughs> off okay. guard and I'm gonna go for 72 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Well done. A notifiable, a notifiable breach Good has gosh. to be reported to the relevant supervisory authority within 72 hours. Do you think anybody knows this? I, 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 I hope not. <laughs> uh, if the breach is uh, sufficiently serious to warrant notification to the public, the organisation responsible must do so immediately. So what happens if we fail to notify? Breaches are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and maximum fines for failure to notify serious breaches can be extremely high. This emphasis, uh, this, sorry, this emphasizes the need for all staff to understand the GDPR and the importance of having in place robust breach detection, investigation and internal reporting procedures. This re-emphasizes what I was saying about it being appropriate for, for all staff to have an understanding of what the course is all about. So without taking you through um, the, the test, which there is a, a, a knowledge test at the end of all of our, well, the majority of our courses, particularly this one, we have to make sure the staff understand the content. That is in detail our new GDPR course. Um, we are aware there's a number of other GDPR courses on the market, but we hope that this is one that sort of fits in with your sort of learning mix, particularly with existing work right customers um, looking for a, a single source to, to carry out all training. It slots in nicely with our other health and safety and HR courses. Hopefully the content and the tone is appropriate for, for your needs. But um, have we got any questions, Chris? Well, thanks, Ryan. Um, fascinating. I think although on the face of it, it's quite a dry subject. Um, I think it's particularly fascinating in a world where data is not just being increasingly collected but the the big data and ai technologies that are emerging um really actually make you making use of it and and um quite scary what can be done with it nowadays and it's, it's really really quite an important subject um we have had um quite an overwhelming number of questions actually and so th I, we are we're already running over so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna plum pick just a few of them um and we'll discuss them and, and any other questions that have been asked We'll collate um, and provide some responses that will go uh, on the website, along with a um, video recording of this uh, of this webinar. Anyway, um, within the next couple of days, so so look out for that. Um, it's posturite.co.uk forward slash webinars for those that don't already know. So uh, one question here is how how do you store i think that's uh, therefore we store the data of our employ uh, of the employees so i think that's how how workright currently protects the data of employees that we are um the data processor for well i think chris seeing as people have been put through my dulcet tones for long enough that's a question that you'd be best answering oh thank thanks ryan <laughs> okay uh so um i think very very broadly, because um, you're obviously going through a lot of detail with this, but um, sort of broad brush is that 
all data that we hold uh, is encrypted. Um, we have uh, something called role, roles-based access controls to govern who uh, who can access the uh, particular data. Um, all access is audited, um, logged, so that can be reviewed um, at a later date. We have we have data deletion policies, which we've actually reviewed and rewritten um, for GDPR, um, but also how we've then put that into practice as well. So how we give the control to the data controller, um, typically companies that um, use Workrite, how they'll go around um, deleting data that they have put within Workrite. Um, we've also revised things like our um, backup retention policies as well. Uh, traditionally, you hold backups for a long time, but actually they sort of form part of the um, erasure and, and, and rights to be forgotten. So our backup retention policy has been changed as well to conform with the data um, deletion requests. There's a lot more to it, and, uh, and but uh, I think that uh, covers the top parts. Great, Chris, thank you. Have we got time for one more? Uh, I reckon we could squeeze a couple in. A couple so. more in, okay. Uh, let's, uh, in accordance with GDPR, how long should we keep DSE assessments? I'll let you carry on, Chris. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, um, I guess I guess maybe a, a broader or a, a more appropriate question is just in general, how long we should be keeping DSE assessments? GDPR is one part of that. I guess there's, there's health and safety legislation as well as other bits and bobs that would inform how long a specific business um, chooses to keep their de-assessments for because I don't think there's a necessarily a set rule. Certainly within GDPR the answer would be no longer than is necessary but then that is quite ambiguous. So um, I guess the things that you'd need to think about while deciding on your own uh, policy within a company would be um, the risk of a legal claim against you um, and then there's, there's probably two different uh, specific stages of somebody's employment. So actually while they're employed, you might decide to keep it for the whole time they're employed, let's say. Uh, but then you need to think about how long you'd keep that information once they've actually left the business as well. Um, but there's, I don't think there's a particularly hard and fast rule, certainly not one that is within my uh, instant grasp. So, um, but I, I think it's more than just a GDPR question. Okay, there's a second part to this question as well. So if, if these are not identified, how do you delete the records at the specified date and can this be automated? Okay, um, so some of the new things we've written for Workrite specifically is um, data deletion policies. So um, this is a um, company by company setting um, which is um, we need to contact support currently in order to set them up uh, just while we get uh, the process up and running and make sure it's nicely controlled. Um, the default is that we will keep the records indefinitely um, unless we've been informed otherwise, but um, anybody that wants to, uh, because we're the data processor and not the controller, it's uh, worth pointing out. But any data controller that gets in contact with us, uh, with support, we can then set that up and then it's fully automated and the records get deleted um, in line with their retention policies. Excellent. Uh, just squeeze a couple, two more in. Um, how does an encrypted email work? And this one is one I have not going to even attempt, Chris. <laughs> this is going straight back to you. Okay. Um, cool. They're all firing my way, aren't they? So um, encrypted emails, um, again, quite a broad topic. There are specific software solutions you can get um, that will um, kind of add a layer on top of email um, and encrypt them, maybe send a notification which you need to uh, uh, do so at the other end. So I think NHS Trust used them as one example. Um, however, uh, I think um, in general, what we should be talking about is the transport of that email as well. Um, the customer system at the other end is not our responsibility, so we need to make sure the information is encrypted at our end and all the way through until it gets to uh, the other. So that actually uses um, something called TLS, so uh, SMT over TLS to be really technical. Um, all of our emails use something called opportuni opportunistic TLS, which basically means we will encrypt an email that's going out of our system whenever we can. Um, in reality, that's the majority of email traffic nowadays because systems, systems at the other end will support it. However, it's not a guarantee. With a lot of customers, um, 
we've actually we've set something up called enforced TLS, where we um, we agree with their IT department on a set of standards and certificates, and we will only send the email if it conform if it's being sent encrypted and conforms to the pre-agreed certificate. So that guarantees that the emails leaving us getting to the customer will have been encrypted all of that way and then it's handed off to the customer to do what they would want to do further to that once once it's there. Um, yeah, I think um yeah, it's another two parter actually. So how, how how does the encrypted email work? But also how does the recipient unlock the encrypted messages? Okay. So if you were using some software, there would be a process for that, which I, uh, as we're not talking about a specific piece of software, I can't really answer that. But with TLS, there's nothing to do for the customer at the other end because it goes into their email system and it could be viewed, um, whether it's through Outlook or Webmail, which would all have been encrypted and, and, and whatnot. Um, but a ch a, an important change we have made to WorkRight um, because we reviewed all the automated emails that we send. Um, we've tried to remove as much personal information out of the emails that we're sending anyway as good practice. And when there is personal um, or um, special information within the email that does need to be communicated, we've changed a lot of the emails so they will be notifications in future as opposed to having the contents or an attachment in the email with a, um, a note just to say, please log in to work right to retrieve the email it is ready for you to download um, so it's a over it's a belt and braces um, solution which takes care of those that perhaps wouldn't have got their email system set up correctly uh, emails are still a bit of a wild west in the IT world so Chris that's great that's I'm um, not going to go for any more questions because we are running over by about 10 minutes so far but hopefully for everybody that's been been useful to see uh, the course maybe hear a few questions that we're getting from customers um, we, we, we will respond in full um, as Chris has mentioned to all the other questions that we haven't had a chance to to answer uh, but I, I did promise at the beginning or Chris promised in his intro that there would be a promotion code for our new GDPR course some of you may have spotted that pop up at the bottom of the screen whilst I was hovering over the icon previously but if you were to get in contact with our support at workright.co.uk, our support team there, um, the promo code is GDPR20. That if you quote that, you will get a um, you'll be quoted a 20% discount price on our GDPR course. So, existing customers, if you are Access All Areas customers, you will get access to that um, as part of your Access All Areas um, package. Um, customers utilize, utilizing work right courses but not on access all areas and um, we'll be able to quote for you for um, the course and also brand new customers as well so if you're just coming to us for the first time and this is the first you're hearing about GDPR we are um, heavily in the health and safety in HR type subjects market so there's a, a whole suite of courses there as well so not to overload you with information if GDPR is your main and main priority but a quote there for that particular course that you've just seen for your staff is um, going to save you 20%. So I shan't labour that anymore. You'll obviously see that I'm the sales manager and Chris is the technical director. Um, <laughs> Don't know if that was technical, obvious. <laughs> all the technical questions go his way and I talk about the commercials. But yeah, like like I say, hopefully that's been of use to you. Um, we really appreciate you listening in and um, thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>